is Steve Politi from NJ Advance Media, and welcome back to the Rutgers Rant, a very special Rutgers Rant. Crank, Cratchy, you're old enough to remember sitcoms when they were, it's a very special episode of a Different Strokes yeah. this week. Yes. Did you have that when you, okay, when you were growing up as well? I wasn't sure if that was just something from my generation. No, I mean, I, I didn't really have them, but I usually, I know that when I, I guess we did have them when I was a kid, but usually, you know, like somebody was going to like try to kidnap you or <laughs> that's exactly it. And you learned about stranger right. danger or drugs or something. So. Oh, absolutely. They, they would have a party someplace and Mrs. Garrett yeah. would show up and go, oh, Tootie. Uh, and it would be a two-parter. All right. What was I talking about? Oh, yes. Yeah, a very special Rutgers Rand. I'm yes. joined by James Cratch. Uh, this was this was your idea, Cratch. It's a good one. We thought that it's, since there's so little going on really with, with Rutgers that we would do an entire podcast or most of a podcast devoted to the great what-ifs in Rutgers history. And so here's what we did. Uh, we asked our uh, people, our friends on the Rutgers Insider uh, program to text us some of their suggestions. Uh, Cratch and I each made our list of the top 10 greatest what ifs in Rutgers history. They were very different, kind of funny. Uh, we're gonna go, I made the aggregate of that, uh, uh, of those two lists to come up with, you know, a combined top 10. Each one of us are going to give their own our own number one because uh, you know we both have very unusual number ones when it comes to the uh, biggest what if in Rutgers history, uh, and then we'll just break them all down. It'll be fun. Are you ready? I am ready. Born ready for this one. All right. The number ten biggest what if in Rutgers history? What if the illegal man downfield penalty wasn't called against the Scarlet Knights? when they were playing Louisville in 2012. Uh, this is a good one, I think, because it really, you know, if you, uh, you weren't at, you weren't covering Rutgers at the time crash, but 14-3, no. uh, they were the better team, Rutgers against Louisville. Teddy Bridgewater was hurt. You know, it, one of the boldest plays uh, in yes. Rutgers history, called a, was it called a fake field goal? Wasn't it a fake field goal? I'm trying to think back now. Um, Anyway, the play, it was, the play was, it was a touchdown, a beautiful play, uh, would have put them up 21-3 in control of the game. Uh, and, and it was, it was whistled for a legal man downfield call. And mm -hmm. you know, we didn't know it at the time. We didn't know what it was. But when you went back and look at the film, there was no question that this was not a penalty. It was just, it was just a terrible call. And after the, after the penalty, of course, because it's Rutgers instead of, you know, getting creative or going for the long field goal. Kyle Flood punched from his own 30, and the rest is downhill from there. Um, what do you think? Does this, the, this one belong on the list of the greatest what-ifs? I think so. I mean, actually, 2012, so I, that was my – I was covering high school sports for my first season uh, with, at Dorf with the ledger at J.com. Yeah, because I, – and I, I know we're going to talk about Greg later on, and I wrote that kind of dream piece back in the craziness of the fall – if they win that game, they win the Big East, they go to the Sugar Bowl, yeah. they you know, they could have just as well have beaten a Florida team that had kind of packed it in as, you know, a Louisville ended up doing. So yeah, I mean, you win that game, you're you're Big East champions, you've got that banner, you finally have your first conference title, and you might win the Sugar Bowl on top of it. Yeah. And and if if they win that game, Tim Pernetti tears up Kyle Flood's contract, gives him a new one, uh, a bigger one and extend you know, it just changes the entire dynamic of that too. I mean you could be yeah. you know and certainly if we learned later in Rutgers history what happens with uh with Kyle Flood and how things kind of fell apart. Um but who knows if they do get there, if they do get to the Sugar Bowl, as you say, and win, you know, then maybe the next year the recruiting class doesn't fall apart. Maybe things go Kyle Flood's way. And instead of, you know, kind of getting run out of town well past his expiration date, uh, that he, he can keep the program going in the way that Greg Shannon got going. So, yeah. Uh, I have no. Uh, yes, I certainly think this is a this is a huge what if, and for it to come down to one bogus penalty is really kind of remarkable. Yes, definitely. All right. Number nine, kind of a current one, the current event. What if the pandemic came a month or two later? Which is to say, what if there was a twin, the 2020 NCAA tournament was played? Cratch, what, what would that have meant for, for the entire Rutgers program? I mean, first of all, I think that the, 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 the week – no matter what happened with Michigan in the Big Ten tournament, obviously you guys were there when that game got canceled. They would have made the tournament. I think that would have been, first off, there would have been 8,000 people, I think, on Selection Sunday inside yep. the rack. It would have been the, the biggest party the rack has ever seen. 
the, the cathartic moment, the joy, that whole week leading in, I think would have been tremendous. Um, you know, you would, I think you would have had this crazy situation where like, I know like I, I, I talked to some boosters who were planning on going to Minneapolis for the national wrestling tournament and then getting on a plane and going wherever the, the basketball team was and then going back and forth. Um, I think it would have been interesting to see like, you know, how Rutgers could have kind of done and, and for wrestling for a second in the first, you know, post national post Soriano season. Um, women's basketball, I think, was getting back to the NCAA tournament. I think they probably would have been uh, slotted, you know, in a really tough second round game, but they could have potentially won a game for the first time in a while. But I think, yeah. oops, I think there's a very real, depending on the bracket draw, that Rutgers would have won a game or two and got right. into the Sweet 16. Right. For me, and, and this is this is like a, it's it's definitely a what if on the list. This thing, this one, this one could climb the list if yes, this exactly. Rutgers team does not. Do what we think it's capable of doing now. It's good. It should be better next season. Assuming there is a next season, uh, it should make the tournament. Then uh, you know. Then you don't, then you won't look back on this as such a missed opportunity. If though, if it goes the other direction and suddenly Geo gets hurt and you know, uh, yeah, you know, Big Cliff isn't the player they thought it was going to be, and the chemistry's not there, and they lose a couple of games, and they they're only in the NIT and. You know the program doesn't take off the way we think it is. Then you're gonna look back on 2020. You know <laughs> until that streak is until that tournament drought is over. I mean it's gonna loom even larger. That well, that's the thing. Like obviously everyone expects them to be a tournament team again, but Geo's a senior and Ron Harper Jr. is a junior and he's a guy with an NBA pedigree. It's like this yeah. could this coming season could be like the the last shot for this kind of core group. Right, right, absolutely. And Heifel's got to kind of rebuild it all on the fly again. Right. And, I mean, obviously, he's got Cliff, he's got some pieces, he's got Mulcahy, he's got pieces. But still, you know, that's the first kind of iconic group of his might be out the door after one more season. Yep, there's a lot of pressure going on this year. And it's part of because of what happened in, in, in March. All right, <clears throat> number eight. And this one was on your list, but not on my list. So you're going to have to address it. What if Sonny Werblin hired Joe Paterno? Interesting. Take it away. Well, obviously, I, I know I, I read some Star Ledger archives. I guess in the '80s, after you know Joe Paterno won a national title, obviously he's a New York native. Sonny Werblin made a big push. Was going to want to pay him a million dollars a year. Um, who knows how much of it is actually how close they were to happening, or maybe how much, some of it's maybe myth that's kind of grown over the years. But it seems like at the very least, Joe Paterno considered taking the Rutgers job. Now, whether he would have. Well, so what happens if he does take it? I mean, can he kind of duplicate the same success he had at Penn State at Rutgers? The one kind of thing I'll say against that is Joe Paterno, you know, he wasn't turning churning out dominant teams like, you know, Bear Bryant every season necessarily. So right. maybe he wouldn't have had the same magic touch. But I just think, obviously, any time, you know, putting aside how Joe Paterno's career and life ended, um, anytime you have a guy of his, you know, stature in college football who potentially wanted, was considering taking your job, you've got to wonder what if. It's interesting because, you know, and, and our list does not have something that dates back to, you know, to the to the forties, the thirties, or fifties. Yeah. Uh, a little bit, a little bit, I'll, maybe a little bit. You will, yeah. but for the most part, we're kind of current stuff, and you know, it it, it really does go down to this goes back to the general, the, the broader what if about Rutgers football is it what if you know someone said in nineteen fifty. We, hey, if Penn State can be, why can't we be a regional power? Why shouldn't we emphasize football? Instead, the program went the other direction, obviously, and it wasn't until much later, well after Joe Paterno had established Penn State as a, you know, as, as, as a powerhouse before Rutgers finally decided to get in the game. Uh, so that was, I mean, that's a great one. And I, it would have been fascinating to see if they did have, if they could have, if they did have an iconic coach and they paid him, and obviously Sonny Werblin is one of the people uh, most responsible for Rutgers's move to the big time athletics. That yeah, I, I think it belongs on the list. Good one. All right, we're here with number seven. While while on the topic of Penn State, <laughs> what if Saquon Barkley came to Rutgers? And we both had this one low on the list. That's why I got here. Uh, it's an interesting question. Obviously, he was you know identified. Uh, by I believe by uh, Coach Norris, right? Coach Norris Wilson. Uh, I believe so. Yes. And and before anybody got onto him, he committed early. He was, you know, uh, 
cornerstone of the class. They thought he was going to be the guy, you know, he could have been the guy to come in here and, and he could have been the, the great, the next Ray Rice for this program. And instead took a recruiting visit to Penn state, saw the, the massive crowd, fell in love with James Franklin and the rest is history. I mean, it's, it's hard to paint it all, you know, the collapse of what happened there yeah. and that era of Rutgers football on one player. But I mean, it's certainly, he's certainly a great player. Yeah, no, I mean, I think he's definitely, um, he's definitely the type of, you know, generational college football player that can kind of mask a lot of issues. Because remember, um, he graduated, you know, I'm not graduate. He left, he goes to the Giants. The Penn State offense wasn't as good the next year. No. You know, even with Trace McSorley, they, they took a, a step back. So I think he was the type of guy who masks so much. And I know I'm kind of cheating, but, you know, obviously – our man Dunleavy probably never sends out his tweet, so there's <laughs> him a lot of it. Yeah. And I think, what if I just hit me when you mentioned Norris Wilson that I never put on the list is, what if I remember I was covering the Giants at the time. I remember watching the, the fourth down spike game, Michigan State. Yes. I've always wondered, what if Rutgers had done what I what I actually I didn't say it obviously, but I thought in mind that they should have fired Kyle Flood that next morning and said, you know, Norris Wilson got our kids ready to play. He's our head coach. <laughs> Like, what, how would that have changed everything for Rutgers? Yeah, so Chris Laviano, several people, uh, uh, several Rutgers Insiders people mentioned the Chris Laviano, uh, yeah. what if. And I should mention that we had about over 100 responses from people. Oh, it was watching. tremendous. It was great. I remember watching that game being like, he's going to spike the ball on the fourth down. He, uh, uh, he's going to spike, like, like, oh, my God, he's going to do this. And they did it. Yeah, the great part about it is in the press box, it took us like, you know, because you're so crazy. We're working on it's a deadline game. We're writing. So if, it just took us. A couple of seconds to figure, like all of us, the, when, when the light bulb went oh. on, like, oh my god, <laughs> it was really, it was, it was yeah. amazing. That was crazy. Um, all right, that's a good one. Saquon Barkley becomes the Rutgers. I think there's a chance that the arc of that program uh, changes. I know number six. I know if this happens, the arc of everything changes. What if James Townsend? caught the ball and this is the one that comes back to me a lot it's number six on my list i think it could be much higher and we're referring to of course the 2000 uh rutgers west virginia game uh and you know mike teal where they're having a day the offense is exploding uh poised to quite to kind of blow them out you know really set the tone for this game james townsend is wide open in the end zone mike teal delivers what had to be one of the best passes of his life hits the kid on the hands and I feel bad because obviously James Townsend is no, was no professional player. He's not Kenny Britt. He's not even Taekwondo Underwood. He's not that level of kid. Uh, but, you know, if he catches that ball and Rutgers beats West Virginia, they might not go to the Orange Bowl. They might have gone to the Rose Bowl at the time. That's what some of the discussions were. Uh, and yeah. for me, when you think about, you know, it, of course, in, in typical Rutgers luck, this is the year when the Big East Bowl bids – bowl, you know, whatever system collapsed. And instead of, you know, the, the fall from going potentially to the Rose Bowl was going to the Texas Bowl. And it's just, it was such a demoralizing thing for the program and they made the best of it. Uh, it was still, you know, a thousand, tens of thousands of Rutgers fans went to the use of the game. But man, I mean, if that if they had pulled that up to win and lost in triple overtime against, against uh, West Virginia, it would have been a different program. Totally different program. And, you know, Someone really know, like people say, think I'm an idiot for saying this. College football is a lot more fun when the BCS was around because yeah. you just had crazy stuff like that happen at the end of the season, and it was just mayhem. And you could be going to the Rose Bowl and then lose a game and be going to the Texas Bowl. Uh, but yes, I think totally because I think it, 2006 was huge and a little bit like if they go to the Rose Bowl, that speaks to people. I think more right. than going to the Texas Bowl, like. If they go to the Rose Bowl, more people want to be, you know, they're tied to it because it's it's the Rose Bowl. Of course, yeah, and then and then it validates everything. There's no, it, you, you cross off the whole idea that Rutgers is a one game program. Uh, I think, I mean, who knows? We'll obviously address this big what if later, but I mean, that would have been much easier for for Greg Schiano to say, oh, this is this is, you know, he would have a lifetime contract. So it would have been. Um, you know, he, the amount of things he leveraged just based on the Louisville win. Can you imagine he, what he, how much leverage he would have had if he tried to build this program if they were, you know, in Pasadena or even at, even at the time it wasn't Pasadena. They were turned out to be Miami in the Orange Bowl. It would have just been a huge oh, thing. Friendly. Yeah. 
Um, this really this to me is just it's, it's just a tragic what if. Uh, number five, what if Notre Dame joined the Big Ten? This is an interesting one. You had this number two on your list, Cratch. Tell me why. Yes. Well, because I, I remember having a conversation with John McNulty one time. If Notre Dame joins the Big Ten back when Nebraska joined, right. the Big Ten is done. Yeah. They don't add Nebraska. They, they, they're at 12. They're done. So I think if, if that happens, then conference expansion probably never spins out of control. And then if you go back to when Rutgers joined the Big Ten, if Notre Dame calls the Big Ten and says, hey, we want in, there's a very good chance to note that the Big Ten takes Maryland over Rutgers. Yeah. And then if the ACC takes UConn, <laughs> Rutgers could be Rutgers could be UConn right now. Right. Yeah. Just to prove. So I, yeah. think, I think the, the but bottom line being, if the Big Ten had ever signaled to, excuse me, if Notre Dame had ever said to the Big Ten, we're in, that would have shut down any Big Ten expansion and Rutgers would have been left out. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It's amazing when you think about it. And, and instead, you know, one of the, one of the good, and one of the good what ifs in Rutgers history, you know, the, the, the table shifted to the point where Rutgers could get that invitation. Yeah. I mean, exactly. it, it is really kind of a remarkable, um, you know, the entire conference you can, you can look back. There's so many what ifs with, with the conference affil- affiliations. But I mean, if the Big East hadn't crumbled, if, you know, Syracuse and Pittsburgh hadn't gone to East, I mean, there's many, so many things happened that ended up with the domino falling for records to get in the Big Ten. And that's, that's a big one about Notre Dame. Absolutely. All right. Number four. What if Villanova didn't steal away Jay Wright? We both had this on the list. I was surprised. We both had it high on the list. Uh, it's higher than I thought it would be, but. It's a good one. I mean, at the time, you know, yeah. you, you know Bob Mulcahy he had Jay had Jay Wright. He was the hottest coach, Hofstra coach. Had built that program up. He was a young, dynamic recruiter in the East Coast. You know, Mulcahy thought he was going to hire Jay Wright, and be, he would be the face of that program. Instead, of course, you no know, big what if. Notre Dame. Notre, I'm sorry, uh, Villanova fires Steve Lapis. Uh, swoops in. You know, picks, picks, picks Jay right away before he can, uh, before Mulcahy can get the ink on the contract. Uh, it's, it's kind of a fact. I mean, I think certainly the arc of the basketball program would be much different. Definitely. Now, I mean, I, I kind of was unsure where to put this one because I've talked to some people who have said even if Jay Wright had taken the Rutgers job, they think there's a very good chance that two, you know, two, three years after right. that, he would have still gone to Villanova. Yeah. That if Villanova was home for him, that's that's the job he wanted. But even then, he may have accomplished enough in three seasons to put the team on much better standing going forward. You know, if Jay Wright gets to the you know gets to the NCAA tournament in three years and then bolts for Villanova, the job is much more you know appealing to, to better coaches. So that could have even even if he doesn't stay forever and become an institution. I think that he would have at least put the program in a better spot moving forward. Right. Yeah. Instead, you know, Rutgers went on a, a long track, right? A long uh, string of hiring, uh, you know, obviously subpar and in some case, uh, lunatic head coaches. Uh, and yeah, yeah and, and it, it's, this is something that has not been righted until now. So this was a 20 year thing. I mean, that was, that's how long ago this was. It's kind of amazing to think about how that arc, even if Jay Wright had, and I agree with you totally. I mean, Jay Wright was not, he it was not, a, that was not going to be a destination job for him. He would have, he would have jumped quicker, but you know, even, even a couple of years would have gotten the brand up higher, would have elevated the entire thing to the point where I think you're right. They would have been in a much better situation. All right. Number three. What if Rutgers had joined the original Big East? I mean, this this is a major one, uh, and I tied it in. I had it on my list. You didn't have it on your list, so it didn't make it. I just kind of jokingly said, what if Fred Gruninger had decided to be a gym teacher instead of an athletic administrator? Because, yeah. and I, you know, I know there are, there are high-ranking people, big-time boosters, and nothing against, he's a very nice man, who were just flabbergasted when – Fred Gruninger was added to the Rutgers Hall of, Hall of Fame. And I know he's 25 years. He accomplished a lot of things. You know, you want to, you know, you want it, It's just, a, I mean, it's just a distinction. It's not, not a big deal, but they were still amazed because of decisions like this, which, uh, you know, at the time he thought the best place for Rutgers was going to be in the Eastern football conference that Joe Paterno was dreaming about and trying to form. And instead of taking the invitation to what became very quickly, the premier basketball league in the country. 
he decided he said no. I mean, think about think about what would have happened, Cratch, if 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 they said yes to that. Oh, it would have been, I mean, I think it, it definitely. I don't. It doesn't for football. I mean, obviously, the Big East still became the Big East. You know, they wouldn't have had a football league probably until around the same time when Rutgers finally did join. But the basketball program would have been on such right. a different footing um, that and and the other sports at the school for that matter too. That I think it, you probably would have had a much stronger foundation for the athletic department. Sure. Uh, maybe it wouldn't have been a massive difference for football, but you at least would have had a, a much stronger foundation for hoops and for others. Right. And the domino that fell, obviously, Seton Hall gets that gets that spot, and it transformed their program. So, I mean, this exactly. is a decision that. Uh, although I will say, there's like a, you know, with all of these things, you, you know, you don't know which where things are going to go. If they do take it, is Rutgers in the Big Ten today? I mean, it's interesting to think about, like what would have happened. You know, over the years, if 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 they had gone that direction, uh, you know, obviously we don't know. That's why it's a good what if. All right, number two. What if Greg Schiano never left? And this is like I think of you know I think of George Bailey standing on the bridge in Bedford Falls, or in I guess it wasn't Bedford Falls at the time; it was Pottersville at the end of the movie, uh, with the greatest Christmas movie of all time. Um, you know, there's so many things that you, you, that could have been different if if Greg Schiano said, "You know what? I'm just I'm going to ride it out. I'm happy here. I don't want to go to the NFL. I, I you know, I, I I I'm confident." And I talked to him. And I you know, I wrote the column this this winter about it. I sat down, and it's clear clear that he has a some major regret about leaving Piscate what, what he did uh, because he just you know obviously. Eight months later, the Big Ten comes calling, and that's what he wanted. From he wanted this what he wanted for the Rutgers program. That's where he thought Rutgers belonged. He just thought they were never going to get there. He thought that Rutgers was was going to be condemned to playing Tulsa on Wednesday nights in the rain. You know, they, they, this was this is what yeah. happened. Uh, I think if he stays, you can just start. You, you tick them off. We, you, you wouldn't have had the Mike Rice situation because he was involved in everything. He would have. Told Tim Pernetti, you got to fire this guy right now. I mean, I think you would have, you know, certainly the, the program that was his next bet, that was his best team that came up. That was the most talented team. Yeah. You know, that team would have been on better footing. I can't guarantee it would have won the, you know, the, the league at the time, but certainly it would have been in a much position, better position to do so. And then obviously, when the Big Ten finally came calling, he would still be recruiting on a level where, you know, it wouldn't be where we are now with, the, you know, with trying to, to scrape out of the basement. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember I wrote the, the, the little take, obviously, back during the fall. I think there's no doubt in my mind that if Greg had stayed one, like, the, the, the program was to be on better standing, you know, there'd be more people in the stands, be more excitement, you know, they'd, they'd be making more money. I'm sure Greg would have won at least one conference title. Maybe it's 2012 in the Big East. Maybe they, you know, win that year in the American. They would have won a title. Right, right. They would have been to more bowl games. They would have won more games. I don't think, though, that we'd be sitting here talking about a uh, Big Ten East title no, or a no. Big Ten title or a national title. I just think the program would be respectable nationally, which is what they really haven't been. Yeah, we would be talking about, you know, all right, they, so this year they, they just said they went seven and five last year. We'd be talking about, all right, well, this recruiting class could be enough to elevate them and then take, take over where Michigan State is. We'd be talking about things that are football, not, you know, not – are they going to lose 80 to seven? There would be none of that. There'd be no 80 to seven losses. There'd be no, none of this just embarrassment. The fan base would have, would have stayed to a point where it was respectable. I mean, there's so many different things. My guess is they would have, they maybe would have upset Penn State at least once by. Right. They would have had it. The last, yeah. the last two seasons, Greg would have beaten Penn State one of those two years. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. um, I don't know if he'd beaten Ohio State. But you know, I'm sure he would have beaten Michigan State at least once. Right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. There'd be no Kyle Flood. There'd be no none of that. Chris Ash is just, just yeah, it, it's so many things that uh that are obvious uh if he had never left. And that's why that was both very it was number two and number three on our lists. Number one on your list. You go first. What do you got? So what if <laughs> went back in the beginning, they built the campus in rural Hunterdon County. I love it. And let me explain. When we it's and Steve knows this. So back when we were discussing ideas to sell, you know, to commemorate the 150th anniversary, I had this very ambitious idea that we quickly realized we could not accomplish to to do a fake documentary about the alternate history of Rutgers football. 
basically imagining what if Rutgers had played the first game and then done everything right to get to the point where 2019, 150th anniversary, they are a national pal. <laughs> and one of the things I said, and I, I feel like, well, and I know Greg, Greg's mentioned this on his interesting press comments about how, like, the Rutgers campus, they've done a lot of work, a lot of building. It, it's, it really looks much better than it used to. Yep. But as a kid who grew up in New Jersey and then, you know, visited Rutgers and, and was probably going to go there, but then, got, you know, got a finance, you know, looked, went to South Carolina, you went to North Carolina. We went to these beautiful kind of college town sprawling campuses that didn't, didn't need a bus system to get around. You know, didn't have rundown areas, weren't so close to a, a city like that. You know, what if they had just built the campus like in Lambertville and this big bucolic sprawling campus where you can walk to everything and there's a campus stadium and there's brick and there's green. And like, I just always thought like, would that have generated more pride in the state university, the culture of New Jersey to want to go to Rutgers to play for the home team? You know, would, would we sit here and would we talk about Lambertville or West Amwell or Frenchtown the way we talk about Ann Arbor and, you know, aughts, you know aught, like those classic college towns, Madison, they'll just roll off the tongue. Yeah, it's a fact. Would we think about Rutgers like that and would that have been more of a state pride thing and obviously more success athletically? Right. I guess. Yeah. The academic, I, yeah, well, that's the thing, though. Would, it, would they have then you know, would it have changed their philosophy on athletics? You know, that's, I guess that's what we don't know. With having that campus, would they had the facilities, you know, or would it have been the same people who think that Rutgers belonged with the Ivy Leagues and the Princeton model? And then, then it, would, it, would it have been, you know, I guess that's the only question I have. Did, did the campus matter enough that it would have changed the entire perception of athletics in the 1930s, 40s, 50s? Yeah. We'll never know. I guess we'll never know. But, like, what if they had actually – Day one, when they became a state university, like been able to hit the ground running and be the state university yeah, yeah. other states have. Great question. All right. So again, we we both we both decided to pick one that was a little bit more uh, a little different, a little outside the box. My number one, and I've wondered about this every day for the last ten years, not every day, but I've wondered about it a lot for the last ten years. What if they just paid off Eric Murdoch? And I've thought about the you know, what happens in big time athletics, and of course, Eric Mur Murdoch is the one who had the clips, uh, went up and got the Oprah and went through the, the many, many instances of Rutgers practice film with Mike Rice to find the damning clips that really set off the dominoes that destroyed Rutgers athletics. I mean, if you, you can look at it that way, it's the only way you really, only way you can really look at it. What if they just, he wanted $900,000. And I think about decisions that are made in places like Auburn and places like Alabama and even Michigan or Ohio State, powerhouses that know how to solve problems. They, they throw money to make things go away. Rutgers refuse to budge. And this is something that happens all the time here with, you know, when a little bit of cash, when a buyout, when something can erase a problem at Rutgers, it doesn't happen. Uh, and it hadn't happened until recently when, 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 you know, when you saw what happened with Chris Ash and, and in some instances like that. If they had written a check to Eric Murdoch, maybe those clips still get out. I, I, I think that's what they, they were thinking all along. Uh, but I also think there's some pride involved and they dug in. They decided that, well, you're not gonna, we're not going to pay this guy. He's, he's, extor he's extorting us. But if they had paid him off and he went away and the clips went away and Mike Rice, who had changed his behavior, big, you know, became somewhat of, of a human being, of a coach. Tim Pernetti does not get fired. Julie Herman does not become athletic director. I mean, just go on and on and on. Kyle Flood, after a bad second season, would have gotten fired because Pernetti would have had would have done it that year. The football program wouldn't have been further in the hole. I mean, just keep it. You wouldn't have this black mark, this thing that the Rutgers is known for, this you know awful thing on the news. I mean, just go through all the different uh, all the different dominoes that might have fallen if they had just written that check. No, I think it's definitely compelling. I mean, the one thing I will always say um, is that I've talked to people in the past. I said, even if that doesn't happen, like, would something have still happened, you know, with, with Mike Rice and even Tim Pernetti that would have eventually, like, gone wrong? You know, like, basically the point being, even if that doesn't come out, 
they don't think that we're standing here today and Tim Pernay is still the AD and Mike Wright's still right. Well, that's possible too. Yep. So, that is, that is entirely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I do. Especially with Mike, like you're dealing with some volatile personalities, you know, <laughs> you're dealing, but it's funny. And it, and it's, and I, you know, bringing it to current events, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you know, there was this sense with, with the softball investigation that, well, she, you know, coach Butler became a better coach in her, in her second year. Um, you know, that's but that's what you know a different different coach in their second year. That's the same thing that they they could have been saying about Mike Rice because he did really change his he did really change himself uh, uh, in his in second year. He, you know certainly he was still you know a, a crazy guy on the sidelines, but a lot of that behavior, a lot of the things he was doing wrong in practices, he stopped doing it um, after after that uh, you know after that first year. So that's a great what if. You know, so you guys got your what ifs. We have a long we have a long list of them. I really appreciate everyone who sent them in. This was fun, Cratch. What, what did we miss? Were there, were there any that you thought should have been on the list that we didn't include? You know, one of the things I had written down was just like nine or ten was like, what if Scott Goodell doesn't take the Rutgers wrestling job? Just because I think there's a very good chance that that program maybe gets eliminated down the yeah, road. That's true. And then I don't know if Rutgers gets invited to the Big Ten without a wrestling program. Or even if they do, you know, they're restarting a program, um, you know, from from nothing. You know, I think that's a big thing. I mean, because I know, I think there's a very good chance that if we if we do this show ten years from now, I know it's kind of a scary thought, Steve. <laughs> that Rutgers wrestling could be a, a sport that kind of generates some revenue for the university, yeah. um, just because I think you know Scott, obviously the two national champions, they're, they're filling the rack, the recruiting is improving. You know, they could really kind of take off, and it's all going to be because of you know, what Scott kind of did to the program. So I think that's that's another what if. Um, I know a lot of people say what if Rutgers had gone to the ACC instead. I think that actually would have been a disaster yep. for every sport but football. Like, yeah, football might be a little bit better in the ACC, but all right. basketball, baseball, you know, wrestling wouldn't have that Big Ten, you know, kind of prestige. Basketball and baseball and softball, they'd get their heads kicked in. Of course. Right. You know, Playing in you know those top tier, you'd be so ge. I mean, you're kind of geographically distant now, but I mean, when your closest road trip, you know, is potentially Virginia Tech. I mean, that's not. Yeah, I'll think about what happened to Boston College. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's just that's so absolutely that's a what if. Um, Yeah, there's just too many of them, guys. That's that's my analysis. The final the final thought on the what ifs. Let's have fewer of them. Fewer of them. All right, that was fun, Christ. You want? Well, we have. Where are some things that happened though? You want to just kind of just break down the the last couple since we had our last podcast. It's been a, it's been yeah. an interesting thing. Um, I mean, yeah, where do you want well, to start? I, here, let's start with the obviously what's happening in the country and you know, the response yes. to uh, the George Floyd murder. I like can say that, uh, and what um, you know, just from the Rutgers community at large, has been fascinating. It's been passionate. It's been from all corners of it. I mean, you know, we've seen players chime in on Twitter. We've seen the, the football team produce a really compelling video. Pat Hobbs, a statement. Steve Peichel talked about it eloquently. I mean, it's just, it's just been a really good uh, response. No, it, it definitely has. I think everything has been said is very powerful. And I, I think that the, the big thing has been that everyone, you know, from Luciano, Hobbs, Peichel, you know, Scott Goodale on down have said, you know, we we have to have action. And I thought Michael was very, you know, very kind of, you know, he wants to be at, the, he wants to lead the way. He wants his program to lead the way. So I think obviously it's it's early now, but I'm very, you know, intrigued to see, okay, so six months from now, like what, what's right. been done? Yes. You know, what's, what are they working on? You know, I think that's going to be the big test. I think not just for Rutgers, but in all aspects of society, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, like what's the pro the, What's the process? What progress has been made, and what have people done to make that process? Uh, Vivian Stringer, too. I thought I thought hers. Uh, she had well, the longest statement of yeah. everybody, but I thought there was a lot of very you know thought provoking, powerful things from her in there. And I thought that she really struck an impressive tone of saying like you know we need unity before we can move right. forward. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I you know and I I tweeted at it, hinted at it, but you know what. Uh, what I liked was was just the players like Geo Baker going on there and speaking oh, their definitely. mind. And I and I, you know, he he was doing that a little bit uh, in, in in the winter, and you know, he could you know caught some flack from 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 you know, people who like, well, you should stick to sports and all that nonsense. I hope that's over. I hope we're done with that that whole attitude. 
in society now that we yeah. want someone who is young, who is bright, who is African American to speak their experiences so that we can listen and learn from them. And you know, I want I want to hear more from Geo Baker and Ron Harper and any of the football players who who, who want to talk about it. I hope people like Pat Hobbs, Steve Peichel, Greg Schiano are going to, if not lead those conversations, certainly make sure those conversations are had. And yeah, yeah I agree with you. Yeah. Totally. Go ahead. I was going to say, I agree with you. I hope that, you know, in the next six months, we see something that that's constructive and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, uh, leads the narrative. And I'll say this, like, I, I know, like, and I'm sure you're going to I know, like, when, when Pat Hobbs released his statement, he kind of took some flack, you know, from, from both sides of the, the equation, you know, for what he said in the statement. I, what I was kind of impressed by was, as far as I'm, and if I'm wrong, please email me, tweet me, correct me. Pat was, I think, the first, you know, high-ranking Rutgers official at the university. The yeah. At right. the university, like I think, I am pretty sure that no academic leader made a statement before Pat did. Yeah. So Pat kind of, Pat and the athletic department have led the way for the university yeah. in many it ways. It is not, and it is not easy position for him to be, be in. I mean, yeah. we, you know, we, it, and when you say both sides, I mean, there, I know there's some Twitter flack about him not use, you know using the word police before brutality. I understand that. He also got from the other side from people who do not think it's his place to, to comment on this. And, you know, these are the people who are writing the checks. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a difficult position to be in. Uh, and I, I think, I think he navigated it about as well as you could. Um, all right. So the other thing that dropped this week, finally, we have the softball report. I'm going to say up front that it's long and I been working on coronavirus stuff. I have not had a chance to read it. Uh, but the I mean the takeaway, and I know this, it, what, someone had asked. So, so what was your was the was your report just clickbait? I mean, no. Everything that no. Keith Sargent and Matt Stammeyer had reported about the softball program had been confirmed, and in one case confirmed when it comes to the, the just the disgusting comment that uh, uh, Kristen Butler's uh, husband said on the bus. Concern, con confirmed by nine different players, and this is a guy who said, "No, I never said that." Nine different players said you said it. So I'm pretty I'm pretty comfortable knowing that the Rutgers softball team put a person on the bus, put a person around these athletes who was just an apps the, the biggest creep you can imagine. That's like if if I get no other takeaways from that, that's the one to me that was just wow. Uh what what struck you about it? No, I as I said and I tweeted this, I think if you it's I think seventy one pages, um all of the allegations, and let's be clear, you know, Sarge and Matt, that they obviously did their best. You know, they, you know, verified the allegations, talked to more people than were, you know, saying this on the record, off the record. Um, many of the allegations in the story were, were were verified and corroborated by the independent investigators. You know, the law firm that handled it. Um, you know, there were some things that they kind of said. They concluded, you know, they, they couldn't necessarily find the intent, or maybe people disagreed about exactly what happened. But you know, these all these things happened. You know, the, the comments that, that Marcus Smith made, the the confiscation of the cell phones, uh, the use of you know conditioning as punishment. Um, I you know I think the other big takeaway is that the law firm you know came to the conclusion at Rutgers, and there were multiple layers. You know, obviously, um, you know the the OEC, you know the the, the division that came from the Mike Rice scandal was involved and they came to everything was investigated in good faith. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's my biggest takeaway was that they concluded that Rutgers did its diligence in good faith and that everything that Sarge and Stanmeyer reported was corroborated in the yeah. thing. And now I think it's just, look, but I think it's ultimately coming down. What I think we all kind of assumed was going to happen was that Rutgers is taking the tack that you know they've they've made changes in the program and and they've and they've worked with with Kristen Butler and her staff and that they're in a better place moving forward. Yeah. So I think most people kind of figured that was. Happening. I, I mean I don't I don't know how, I will say this I don't know how you reach all these conclusions. I mean you know there's a I read the part about you know Butler trying to pass off having the player run around her own pile of vomit as some sort of like positive encouragement. I mean I don't know how stuff like that happens and you, there's not some. There's not some level of of, of discipline, and I, and I and I think that what Barty's comment about you know Coach Butler in her second year is different than Coach Butler in her first year is a, is a cop out because hey you know the first year of Coach Butler was you know obviously made a negative impact on the lives and, and the college careers of, of several players. So uh, yeah, the other thing, I, I, the one thing I'll say about that comment was 
Kristen Butler is the Rutgers softball coach because she had a lot of success at another Division One program. Right. Not like she was the first time head yeah. coach. All right. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Greg Schiano, if we want to talk about this really quickly, gets his Vince Wilfork. <laughs> That's the headline I like this week. Uh, another kid out of yes. Florida, another big human being, which they obviously do not have enough of if you've seen them lining up against – Michigan and Ohio State all these years. I mean, what what are your thoughts on the latest uh, recruiting? And are we getting to the point where you know that's going to be it for this recruiting class? The numbers are they there ain't that many more slots. You know, I I don't know about this because you know Greg did a little media tour mm -hmm. yesterday and he was on the Michael K show and he said that he was expecting to have like thirty thirty one scholarship athletes in, in this twenty twenty class. So. so Obviously, you can always, I mean, there's ways around it. You know, maybe guys are going to gray shirt or they're going to, they're considered, you know, he considers them scholarship athletes, but they're getting financial aid. But it just seems to me that, you know, he has, he has a way to kind of work the numbers. So, yeah, I think they're at like 20 or 21 now. I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll, I'll obviously we'll check uh, once we get off the podcast, but who knows? It might, might only be two thirds of the way done, but you're absolutely right. They're getting big humans. Right who can fill in the trenches and generate a pass rush and protect the quarterback, which is what this program desperately needs. Because we've said it a million times, Big Ten is a line of scrimmage league, and Rutgers has not been able to hang there. Right, and I so apologize, far. I hear uh, Angoy from Irvington, not Florida. I got confused. Uh, he, then, then now they're leading for uh, <laughs> running back Brendan Barrow, who's got 30 offers. I mean, you know, it, it's uh, he is, and he is a uh, Florida kid. Uh, you know, it's just clear that they uh, that the recruiting level, and he, if he can take 30, he's got to have to do it because I mean, you can't if he's got this momentum going, he certainly can't uh, can't stop now. Uh, all right, what else do we got? Anything else? What am I missing? Uh, no, I mean, obviously, it sounds like June 22nd is the – actually, something we, we probably can miss. It sounds like June 22nd is when Rutgers athletes and coaches might be back on campus um, as we kind of work through this very – I'll be honest with you, uh, the whole return – and I understand that, obviously, it's going to be very difficult and challenging <clears throat> to keep everything safe as we return to campus, you know, from this pandemic, but – I always assumed that the complicated part was going to be, you know, what do they do when they get to campus in terms of testing and safeguards and, you know, disinfecting things and how they run practices and meetings. The whole process just to set a date has been incredibly convoluted. Yeah. It's, you know, there's so many layers and it's, you know, the state says they can go back on June 22nd and. First of all, I'm just curious, like, how, how did they arrive on June 22nd as opposed to June 15th or June 8th? You know, when, you, you know, obviously the NCAA is allowing people back now. And then, you know, who makes the call? Because what I found is in my reporting is that obviously Big Ten says you can go back. The NCAA says you can go back. Governor Phil Murphy says you can go back. But Rutgers still doesn't necessarily have a plan in place because it sounds like it's up to the university, but the university has to include that as part of their entire, you know, plan to go back to campus for the fall. And obviously that would be more complicated than athletics. So we expect them to be back on campus no earlier than June 22nd. But then again, I guess that could change if the governor passes another executive order to, to make room for Rutgers. So, yeah, really no news is good, you know, there for the most part, except for the fact that Steve Pico believes he's going to be back June 22nd. So, that's when I would expect the football program probably. What was your what was your takeaway on on Chiano's media tour? If do you think he thinks that there's going to be a season? Do you think that he thinks there's going to be a season in front of fans uh, regularly? I mean, what 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 is your sound? I know he's he keeps most of his observations close to the vest, but what's your takeaway from listening to him? I think I think that I would expect he believes there's going to be a season. I have a hard time envisioning. I, I was talking with someone um, close to Rutgers, not in the athletic department, but close to Rutgers, and they just said it's going to be really hard to have fans in the stadium yeah. this year. Yeah. Even when you consider that the attendance they've had in recent years, in theory, could fit into a socially distant configuration, you know, there's just so many things you got to think about. They're like bathrooms. Yeah. Right. Like, how do you, you know, that's one of the issues. You know, I, I think tailgating is another issue um you know food you know like you know someone pointed out to me 
they have those, you know, the, the pump machines, you know, the little pump things for ketchup and mustard and right. barbecue sauce. Right. Can't use those Crazy. anymore. Yeah. So I think your concession prices are probably going to go through the roof because it's going to be more expensive to put, you know, package single serve, you know, food. You know, like, do you not have any hot food at a concession stand? It'd have to be like, you know, Jersey Mike subs that are basically made off and then trucked in and, and put in a refrigerator. So I just, I have a hard time envisioning there being many fans. In I went. I yeah, that. I mean, I was going to say I went to uh, I went to Foxwoods yesterday for a coronavirus column because they opened the, up open up the casino, and just the number of things that are just so strikingly different that some that some lawyer in a room had to think of. Oh yeah, we need to create a machine that will check your temperature at the door. Oh yeah, we have to put these things on the floor that make sure you're six feet apart. Oh yeah, we're going to put up partitions. So when you're playing craps, it's like you're playing in the cone of silence from Get Smart. I mean, just it's just crazy the number of things that 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 they had to do to get back in business. And I know that's indoors, but it's also fewer people. So I mean, football and sports, it's just yeah, I'm, I'm it's going to be wild to see what they have to come up with before they let people back into uh, back into stadiums. Yeah, I mean, the good thing is they have a while. Like I know. A lot was made when the, when the governor of Texas said that he was allowing you know sports to be played at twenty five percent capacity, and I think people kind of got freaked out about that. But then it was like, well, what sporting event is going to be played in the state of Texas before like the end yeah. of August? Yeah. You know, Major League Baseball is nowhere near <laughs> playing. The NBA and the NHL are going to the bubble format. You know, golf's not going to have fans. NASCAR is not going to have fans. College football and the NFL aren't going to start until the fall, so they they do have time. But you know. For me, I think there's going to be two big things, and you know, we're obviously talking, you know, working on stories, talking to experts. One, you know, I think we mentioned this last week. If an outdoor gathering is 35 people, does that mean you can have 35 people sit in one area of the stadium and then put another 35 somewhere else? And two, indoors because the people that, that you want to go to the games, like the students and the boosters, are at the top of the list. And the students, you can you can spread around the stadium. But can you put the boosters in the suites? Yes. That's yep, that is a germ. That Audi Club is a germ factory. Uh, all right. This was a yeah. good podcast, Crash. Let's end it here. I appreciate everyone for giving their suggestions on on the uh, the fun what if list. Uh, covered some other things. We'll be back again soon. Thanks. Thanks again, Crash. Good job today. Thanks.